Okay, Tom, you talked about um, you talked about skinning the game in the last yeah. last race. So you launched uh, NG Racing, which is syndicates in 2019. Yeah. Um, so were the horses chosen using farm mechanics back then? No, there weren't. I mean, that's a, a relatively like new discipline and almost new method that I'm working with and that we're working with. Um, as I said, that was a bit of a COVID project, kind of learning a code and learning, kind of building certain uh, machine learning algorithms and models. Um, those horses um, were picked at, so I used to run a pod, so where the, the history behind that, I used to run a podcast with one of my best friends, James, and James and I kind of grew up together and been really kind of focused on racing since we were, at least since we were 18. And kind of formative years spent in betting shops, kind of figuring out form, even looking at the kind of the bags cards for the grounds and all of that type of stuff. All of the classic mistakes that you uh, that you make when you uh, first step into the betting world. But um, so we were doing that together for about 10 years and just generally bouncing different ideas, like analytical ideas about how you analyze racing, how you interpret form, how horses can improve, what factors contribute to horses improving how can you identify hidden ability and hidden form um, and we ran a podcast um, for a couple of years doing kind of weekly form and orientated around some of those concepts but on the back of the podcast we thought um, good idea to then try and run a couple of syndicates really just as a, a bit of a democratic way for people to get in the game um, and like ran what I think is a, a very fair cost. We try and keep it as reasonable as possible. And um, we have very reasonable kind of rates with the trainer that we use in, in the Northeast here. Um, but those, the initial batch of horses were really bought when we were really quite obsessed with hidden improvement in horses. Um, and that's really about, and it's like we want to do probably in any market, any betting market or bloodstock market, you want to find something that the price you're going to pay for it doesn't really reflect the true ability that you're getting or it's un undervalued based on the hypothesis that you have for, for the asset or for the horse. So, I mean, there we were really looking at horses that we felt had either been running over the wrong trip. So I like trip moves based on kind of pedigree and the profile of the pedigree was a big thing. So if we look through a sales catalog and thought that horse has been running over a mile and it needs a mile and a half, that was an angle in for us and that was therefore perhaps a reason why said horse could be undervalued. One of the first horses we bought, um, it was 6,000 um, guineas or pounds from Doncaster um, called Swinging Eddie. Now he is like, he's probably, he's, we love him. He's an absolute hero, but he's a moderate horse. He's a 65 rated handicapper, but he's won four races for us. Um, and we bought him and we bought him dead cheap. But the reason we bought him was because Early in his races, he was just pulling his head off like he couldn't settle. Um, and this is also another angle you see quite a lot with horses in training sales. Horses that are too keen or can't settle can't display their true ability. So you're not really seeing the full culmination of their ability potential being displayed in races on the track. So because he was so keen and pulling so often early on, um, he couldn't display that ability. and. Then through a period of training, we managed to get him to calm down a little bit. And I mean, as I say, he's not an elite horse, but he's a he's a decent handicapper who's won a couple of races for us. And we managed to get him settled and to win a couple of races. And that's credit to the trainer and it's credit to a couple of the jockeys that have uh, that have ridden him. So it's kind of those different angles, Simon, is understand what what else could be there and come up with a reason behind it and then basically back your opinion. Right, so, so they... Are they run as a business that will continue into bloodstock after the horse's racing career is finished? Or are you looking to lock in a profit? Or, yeah. you know, or is it just purely fun for people that join? What's the actual angle? Right? Yeah, I think like the, the business angle was always going to be to buy horses that you hopefully improve and then you can sell for a, for a profit. Um, and it's really hard with horses in training because they're, effect they're effectively cast-offs, let's put it, Bluntly, people don't want them. And it, or, or certainly the ones you can get for cheap, people don't want anymore. So there's something defective with them. So what you're trying to do is you're trying to find what that defect is or what that hidden abil ability potential is, and you're going to try and unlock it. 
Now that's a seriously hard game, but if you do manage to do that and you manage to improve them, then you can kind of get financially recompensed for it. Probably the best proponents of that, in certainly that I know and in the country, are the horse watchers and the Dixon brothers and the rest of the guys that kind of run that business there. I mean, those guys are excellent judges in understanding why a particular horse perhaps or, or understanding that a horse may have more ability than what how it looks in the form book or how it looks in the kind of currently residing handicap mark and you've seen it with I think it's Razel as one of their kind of really good kind of flagship horses the last couple of years Ross Collin and these are horses that they've bought in say the 60s to 70s bracket but have turned out to be 90s horses so I think when, and I think you had Chris Dixon on here a couple of years ago, but that's a little bit the game for the horses in training. And I would say that's what we were doing originally. And now some of the, the latest ventures are actually in yearlings, which, I mean, it gives you a different type of opportunity, but also a different type of challenge. So you've basically got a blank canvas. So you've, got this, you've not got a horse that is kind of inherently defective or someone doesn't want that you're trying to fix or you're trying to improve. You've got a horse that you've profiled, you want, but then you have to get them on the track and get them to deliver on the ability potential that you uh, feel is there. It's almost a bit more of a purer play than say buying uh, the horses in training. But to answer your question, I think that the main business model is to buy horses, improve them and then sell them, whilst also giving people like a, a very equitable and democratic and hopefully fun way of engaging with a, a syndicate business like we um we have kind of social kind of channel groups for each of our syndicate horses we use an app called telegram which is a bit like a, a whatsapp type app but like everyone in the syndicate's in the group everyone gets the same information um there's no filtering like you'll hear the bad stuff as well as the good stuff and syndicating horses is stuff like horses are fragile animals they quite frequently get injured um, the fir one of the first updates I ever had to give after we bought this swing heavy horse was that he ran into a fence and he was injured and potentially out for half a season or a season. And this is when you've just got 30 strangers together off Twitter who don't know each other. You've basically all sold each other the dream that you're going to buy this horse and they're going to hit the track for you. And then five days later, he runs into a fence. But that's what we try and do. It's equitable ownership and the people in the syndicate hear the same as I hear from the training from the trainer and in the end that's what gives you a rich ownership experience it's not just hearing the good stuff it's also hearing the challenging stuff so that you can learn from it in the future um, and it's also about like having a an equal stake basically in a democratic stake and say you can say what you want you can complain about what you want um, but in the end you're kind of all in it together and you've done well because you've had 80 percent winners five horses four of one yeah so we've had yeah, we, we, it was 100% this time last year. <laughs> we had first four horses, we uh, we got all won. Um, and then the, the latest one hasn't won. He's um, He's been quite challenging, to be honest with you. It's a horse, uh, and the guys in the syndicate won't mind me saying anything because we all share the same outlook. But we bought him with great hopes. like you. Um, and the game always humbles you, I think. I think when... When you listen to Aidan and Brian say that you're learning every day and you have to be very humble in the face of the sport, you really have to be. But I think he was a bit of a humbling experience. We kind of thought, oh, we've done great. The process works. We'll buy another one. We scaled up. So we'd, we'd only spent like, I think we said 6,000 on the first horse, 9,000 on the second horse, 20,000 on the third horse. We spent 30,000 on this horse. Witham River, he's a Galileo, he was out of Joseph O'Brien's yard and he was going to be the flagship and we just haven't managed to get him to work um, and he hasn't won for us and he's dropped down the handicap so it's always going to happen in the end, you're buying enough horses, not all of them are going to win but that was a bit of a savage lesson. You know, I was interviewing um, an owner, a, a breeder trainer the other week and she said to me what people don't realise the, the moment a jockey is put up on a horse for the first time at a race course, the amount of work Oh. that's gone into that horse's life to get it to that point yeah so you buying yearlings you're going to be experiencing all of that yeah 
You go for it. It's a bigger gamble than buying a horse. At least you know it's got some sort of ability. Yeah, I mean, there's, that's the thing. Is like almost the the risk profile or risk potential is higher because I mean, at least if you're buying a horse that's been to the track, you know they can get to the track. So, um, but then that's also why you, you might get certain yearlings cheaper. So again, it's all kind of a, a risk based play, or it's all a probabilistic assessment on kind of potential gains versus versus risk kind of uh, appetite that you're uh, willing to take. But I think that's the biggest thing that I ever learned with ownership is like what it really takes to, to train horses, to develop them, to keep them sound. I mean, you think about these kind of huge, kind of ton animals on these kind of thin legs, kind of going around at fast speeds. Like it's quite a miraculous, I mean, that's why we love it as a sport. It's quite a miraculous sight, but everything that goes up to that point is, uh, Oh, it's really extensive, but having the opportunity and again, syndication, I think that, that I like the concept of syndication. I know some people don't like it, but I think allowing a broad spectrum of people who experience that is fundamental to the growth of the sport globally and also in this country. Okay, now you use one trainer. Yeah. And it's Grant Tour. Yeah. Got the pronunciation right. It is, In yeah. North Yorkshire. So yeah. I was going to say why Grant, obviously, because he's a good trainer. Yeah. But any other particular reason? No, Grant's a, Grant's a good story. There's two main reasons. Um, probably found Grant looking at some trainer statistics back in 2018. Um, and he's done well in the last couple of years. Like, he's grown quite a lot. And he had a real breakout year in 2021. I think he had about a 20% strike rate, which was phenomenal. He might have been in the top five in the country. But um, we found him in 2018. Um, just because he seemed to be getting more winners and also developing horses that he'd bought that were already in training and improving their handicap marks um, than the cost of the horses that he was given kind of almost allowed. That's, um, it's, it's quite a big metric that we use quite a lot, but I use... Um, in this game, everything has to be about context and often we don't understand or pick apart the context enough. For example, if you just look at win strike rate, it doesn't really tell you anything because it's not telling you actually the calibre of horses that a trainer's been given. So you might have a trainer that's got a 20% strike rate, but the average value of horses in the yard is half a million. And then you might have another trainer who has a 20% strike rate, um, and the average value of horses in that yard is 50,000. Um, and now strike rate isn't even the best way to qualify performance, but just as an example, it's very important to contextualize those numbers, basically against expectation. So one metric that we use quite a lot is kind of expected performance, expected wins um, against purchase price. So from the value of horses you've got, how many wins should you be expecting? How what percentage of rivals should you be expecting to beat in your races? What level of official rating, ability, kind of mark should these horses be able to get to? Um, and that, that put us on to Grant because he was overperforming beyond his expectation. Um, he's also quite close, which helps. Um, he's only half an hour down the road. Um, he's also a very good guy. So when we approached him about could we have some horses with him, he suggested we do it over a beer. So I'm never going <laughs> to, when that's the first conversation, now you're pretty much, uh, I'm already signed up to be honest with you. Um, just finally on the syndicate. So, I mean, you've got your, your favorite train in the North. Syndicates are going well yeah. so far, touch wood. If they continue to go well, would you consider also having a trainer in the South to, so you could get the geographical spread of your owners potentially? Yeah, I think so. That would be kind of one of the, the next steps, I think. So we've got um, six horses at the moment. Um, with Grant, um, a couple of them might be sold before the end of the year. But I think, yeah, I would like a, a horse in the South. Um, a trainer that I do like a lot is Alice Haynes. Um, kind of started training out of Newmarket. She's done really well the last couple of years. Again, she's performing kind of well above expectation of the stock that she's got. You even see like big owners like Ammo Racing have started to give her horses because she's clearly got talent. So, um, Probably the next horse and one that goes to the south I'd like to see with uh